Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Catherine Appleton, the Director of Marketing at San Francisco Opera. We're so pleased today to present uh, this talk in partnership with our beloved neighbors, the Asian Art Museum, as we celebrate AAPI Heritage Month and as we prepare for the revival of the Opera Dream of the Red Chamber, which will open on June 14th and run through July 3rd at the War Memorial Opera House. Now, Dream of the Red Chamber is an adaptation of the Chinese novel of the same name by Cao Xixin, one of the most significant, and it's one of the most significant pieces of Chinese literature. It's composed by Bright Shang with the libretto by Shang and playwright David Henry Wong, and it uh, premiered in a sold out run at San Francisco Opera in 2016. I'm very honored today to introduce our moderator, Ken Smith and our two panelists, the Barbara Base Baker Director and CEO of the Asian Art Museum, Dr. Jay Xu, and the production designer for Dream of the Red Chamber, Tim Yip. And together they're going to explore the artistic inspiration behind Yip's gorgeous and intricate sets and costumes for Dream of the Red Chamber. Uh, Dr. Jay Xu is the first Chinese American director at a major US art museum and the first Asian American museum director elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has been executive director of the Asian Art Museum of San, Fran of San Francisco since 2008. And Dr. Xu enjoys a rich variety of international museum experience over a period of 30 years as a research scholar, curator and museum director. He earned his master's and PhD in early Chinese art and archaeology at Princeton University and has previously worked in administrative and curatorial positions at the Shanghai Museum China, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Seattle Art Museum, and the Art Institute of Chicago. He was the Pritzker chairman of the Department of Asian and Ancient Art at the Arts Institute of Chicago and in charge of Arts of Asia and the Ancient Mediterranean World before he joined the Art Museum. Welcome, Dr. Xu. Um, and Tim, he, Tim Yip is a world-renowned visual artist and costume designer and art director for stage and film. And he continuously seeks to explore and communicate his aesthetic concept of new Orientalism, drawing on ancient culture as a means to inspire the future. He works widely in contemporary art, costume, theater, film, and literature. And in 2001, he won the Oscar for Best Art Direction, along with the British Academy of Film and Television Arts Award for Best Costume Design for the film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, becoming the first Chinese person to receive these accolades. Uh, over the past 16 years, Tim has had special exhibitions in Taiwan, France, the Netherlands, and Spain, along with the United States. And his work has been featured in the New York International Asian Art Fair and other significant arts events worldwide. Welcome, Tim. And finally, our moderator, Ken Smith. Um, he's a critic and journalist who has covered arts and culture on five continents for a wide variety of print, broadcast, broadcast, and internet media. And since 2004, until the pandemic, he's divided his time between New York and Hong Kong, where he is the Asian performing arts critic for the Financial Times. He's a winner of the 2020 SOPA Award for Cultural Reporting and the ASCAP Deems Taylor Award for Excellence in Music Writing. He's a regular arts commentator for RTHK Radio 4, a consulting editor and monthly columnist for Opera Magazine in Shanghai, and a frequent contributor to Opera Magazine of London. Uh, he is the author of Fate, Luck, Chance, The Making of the Bonesetter's Daughter Opera, and he has uh, served as a consultant to many cross-cultural projects, including David Henry Wong's bilingual Broadway comedy, Chinglish, and Kung Fu, a musical based on the life of Bruce Lee for New York's Signature Theater. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jay, Tim, and Kent. Well, gentlemen, uh, one thing that I really like about uh, having the two of you together and also uh, some of the images that we'll see a little bit later in our talk that we uh, sort of jointly assembled is that we have two Chinas on display, essentially. And one, uh, and they're very similar, but they're not quite the same. One is curated with a, with a sort of collective eye to history and what we know of uh, as, as a document. And the other is basically curated as a, a very singular look at history in terms of telling a story that brings that world to life. And there, these are two very different ways of essentially looking at the same 
stuff, the same aesthetic, the same culture in a way. Uh, and, but before we, we go any further, I'd like to really get a little view of what we are talking about, what the Qing dynasty really means. And, and Jay, could you share, because this is a, a major part of, of your museum's collection, just what, we're, what this means in terms of the, the continuum of, of Chinese history and culture and what it means today. Yes, thank you. And I'm delighted, Ken, to join you and Kim for this, uh, uh, I promise to be very intriguing, entertaining, and hopefully informative session with uh, Kim's wonderful design that we'll soon see. Qing Dynasty, as we know, was the last imperial dynasty in China's history. It was started in the 17th century and ended in the early decade of the 20th century. So it's a fairly long dynasty. So in many ways, the China's material culture attained its uh, epogees during the Qing Dynasty, particularly in the uh, 18th centuries, the three very powerful and accomplished emperors. Actually, the novel was set uh, during that time frame. But also, it is the beginning of the decline, rather steep decline of the imperial dynasty of China, which uh, ended up uh, being the end of the uh, 2000 year long dynastic imperial period and beginning of the Republic period in China's history. So indeed we have uh, uh, several China we are looking at and uh, one is the China of the 18th centuries of the Qing dynasty, the material culture that we so glad to be the custodian of in the Asian museum. The Qing dynasty art does form a significant part of Asian museum's collection, but also it's a source of inspiration or many artists creations such as Kim's. Yeah, it, it, it also, it very much uh, what you just described also describes pretty much the arc of the novel itself because it is a story that does indeed look back and revel in the, the past in, in the terms of, of how this one family is placed in that world. And also you see the decline and the sometimes steep decline uh, toward the end. Um, this is a story that, that uh, has existed in many different uh, levels. And, and I wanna start uh, bringing Tim into that now in terms of how you view this. Um, first of all, uh, you've had experience on stage, screen, uh, uh, museums, uh, you know, exhibitions, uh, but really I, I think you're, you're most famous for winning the Oscar, I think for Crouching Tiger. That's the first thing people think of for the, the, the 2000 um, uh, Academy Award for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, the visual design. But really uh, people who know you in film realize that um, you go back a ways. I, I, I remember you now from uh, uh, A Better Tomorrow in 1986 mm -hmm. and from, from uh, John Wu and something I've never asked you before. And I'd like to know, are you responsible for Chow Yun-Fat wearing the black trench coat? Oh, actually, we developed together, you know, like uh, Xu Ke, I think is the main people, you know, like at that time, it, it's, it's like a really funny thing that maybe um, not so much people know, but it's really interesting that uh, John Wu is really one to doing something like, uh, you know, man and man relationship with friends and, you know, the true friends and true morality of, of uh, like a man. And then he is really like you know, the Jing, Jing Ke Qi Qing Huang, you know, like the Qi Qi Ke. He always want to be uh, like a, a assassinate in, in uh, ancient time. You know, they have their own rights. They love the nation, they love the, the country, and they satisfy themselves to do something. Mm -hmm. And these kind of things. But at that time, uh, he got, a, a, you know, a chance to make a movie and working with Shui Ke and us. And he want to make the uh, atmosphere. It's, it's like a Wu Xia Pian. It's like a ancient uh, Chinese uh, myth, uh, you know, mystery kind of the kung fu system. Talk about you know the morality of a man, so that you, you can see the the clothes you know from Zhao Yunfa. <laughs> it's actually it's the aesthetic of the old you know the um, Serka, the uh, assassinate heroes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's why you, you designed yeah, yeah, because yeah. You, you picked up on two things that I thought you might say. One is, of course, that Chinese history is, is reflected even in a modern day dress, in, in a modern day story. There's still a reference of how that all plays into it. The second thing is that 
Um, one of the things that once I visited Hong Kong, I realized that the idea of anyone wearing a black trench coat when it's 90 <laughs> degrees out is probably yeah. not realistic. And yet that image sticks with you. Yeah, so, yeah. so you don't feel any need to, to stick to the truth, the objective truth, if the visual image will carry something different. Yes. So, so one of the things that I want to, want to talk to you about with this now is how beholden are you to history, say, if you do uh, a uh, Dream of the Red Chamber, or you know your your other movie with um, uh, uh, John Woo later on, yeah. pieces that really look into history, or Crouching Tiger. How beholden are you to the real designs of that period, and how free do you feel to modernize them to, to make them work for a modern audience? I I think it's. All depends, you know, like who is a director, who is the style of a director. It is the first thing that I, I thinking of. Another thing is how to tell the story, like what you say. Uh, art direction is like a language, so that we can move in colors, moving style, moving the, the set design, moving everything to tell the story. So I, I think if I work with Ang Lee, I, I will have a way of taking the middle size so that you can see all this set is a middle size setting. When you join Wu, I have to say a lot of way for, for, for him to track. <laughs> he he won't moving. <laughs> so that I, I make the right. subject and, and all, all this furniture can be movable so that he, he can he can do his, his style. So I will I will really um concern about how the director talk, tell the story, use the camera. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So there there are two things though that uh, we want to talk about, I want to talk about with this because this is an opera. About a Chinese subject. Uh, this is not the first time you've done a Western opera, and, yeah, yeah. and this is not even the first time you've even done *Dream of the Red Chamber* because you did uh, that the fifty-hour, fifty-episode television series from, from yeah. two thousand and ten. So, yeah. so uh, I want to know first of all, how is this different from working on a Wagner opera, for example? Wagner. How is this story for you different? Um, yes. I think Wagner have been developed into many forms, right? And I just finished, uh, I just doing an opera in, in, in Metropolitan also. So it's also about Wagner. So that I think for me, Wagner is, is you have to take care about the volumes and the simplicity because the music is so full, you know, the music have to tell the story. So that I always take care about the volumes of people, the simplicity of the set to let the music floating around on the space that, that I will do that. And a little reference for the historical, but now I think the trend is um, we are not fixing on the original time frame, right? We're moving the time frame or even yeah. uh, imagination time frame to you know to tell the story and make the music mix with the story again. So it's all about rhythm, about colors, theme, about the deepness of the stage. That's all really important. Mm -hmm. But for uh, yeah. Dream of Red Chamber. It's different because this time we have to show to the Western audience about a Chinese story. And the Chinese story ex exactly is, is really complicated because there are over 100 characters in the original novel, right? <laughs> Everyone is, is so good at writing. You know, the writing is so good for every character. So uh, I think it's really important that it's, it's also they have a um, really special thing for uh, Dream of Red Chamber because the first, the first paragraph Zhou Xiaojun is talking about the world is not real. I telling lies, you know, so that all, all this family yes. is already giving the hints of this is not real. And you see a uh, Jiao Bao, you, the, head, the, the dress is not right because in Qing Dynasty, you have to shape your hair, but he's not, it, it, it's just like, a, you know, like a Beijing opera, a little bit influence costume. And he, uh, you know, the dragon rose, it's, it's all really dramatic. And also Lin Dai Yu is, is something like he, she's not totally uh, Qing Dynasty dress. Maybe early Qing Dynasty. Early Qing Dynasty is more close to Ming Dynasty. And you know, all, all these things is it's like a quite dramatic. It's not based on the realistic. And also they have some scenes to talk about the uh, Tai Shi Huan Jin, you know, like the um the wet dream of <laughs> Chao Pao Yu. Yeah. <laughs> so that they, yes. they are not a will, you know, they're sometimes really real, sometimes it's not real. 
So I have to take care of how to how to move this. So I'm thinking of in this uh, dynasty, uh, Qing dynasty, in the mid Qing dynasty, is actually it's quite a good time, but you know, but it's not good for Chao Shijin, of course. Is is going low, but at that time, you know, Quan Chu is really important for the daily aesthetics, the kind mm -hmm. of colors, the kind of elegant music, the kind of all the other things is really important at that time. And Quan Chu, for people who who aren't quite aware, you're talking about a traditional Chinese opera form. Yeah, 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 the early one, the yeah. more early one. Which, yeah, which, yeah. which involves a lot of, of costuming, which involves a lot of movement. I think, I think we must uh, have, which a, is, have a... Which is, which is yeah. different from Western opera, so you have to... So now also, this is mm. not... Yeah, exactly. So there's, this is also not the first time you've dealt with Dream of the Red Chamber, for example. So uh, I, I wanted to look at two different things. One, what is the existing world like I mean, we, we've seen a lot of, of images from the, the movies and, and, and backwards, uh, working backwards. How much uh, is the visual world of Dream of the Red Chamber something that people respond to? The, the illustrations that were from various editions from the books, um, different things over time. Uh, as you said, uh, images that were, have been on the Chinese opera stage. How yeah. much of that are you working with that people kind of know already and how much are you creating from, and, 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 and who are those original sources? I, I think movie, you know, like uh, Hui Ju, mm. it's like the Shanghai Hui Ju, the old, old uh, local opera. Yes, yes. They have really good uh, Hong Lo Moon, a dream, a dream of Red Chambers reference. They have do really good things, but it's in a local Beijing opera form. So that we are already seeing how Java you look like. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think the most thing important is two uh, painter is really important. One is Sun Wen, Sun Wen. Uh, yes. he, he drawing a beautiful details, uh, colorful uh, you know, painting, it really beautiful and, and drawing all these um, beautiful characters. And other one is called- Kind of the, graphic, kind of the graphic novels of their day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one is called Gai Yi. Gai Yi is back and right, just by mail. It's like just one lines and, and writing all, everything. So two of them is, is really influenced me. You, you, you tell, inspire me to thinking of. I think the, the most important thing is, uh, even if I do it in China, they have training, I still have to think about the silhouette. How, how women moving, how to make this, uh, the time difference coming up interestingly. So that we we have to make a special hair, yes. and special leaves, and and the tail is longer. So that make them really easy to assess to that kind of um, aesthetics. So well, I I think the whole thing is, and now because this is like a, a Western uh, audience, mm -hmm. I change a little bit. I using the Western cutting, and mix with the Chinese cutting. I take away of the patterns of the embroidery and change to an uh, undefined pattern. Yeah. When you look so, at the distance, they will be really Chinese, but when you look detail, they will be some creation. And we have some pictures of that coming up in, in, in a couple of moments. But uh, one other thing that I want to ask, though, is, uh, well, first of all, you, you were saying that the, the cut is different because the level of movement is, mm. is different. Uh, yes. Chinese opera, uh, the costume sort of has to move with the with the performer at times, and and the performer in Chinese opera moves a lot more than a Western opera yeah. singer. Um, so you you can't you can't do the Chinese opera costume because it's really difficult to wear and dance with it. <laughs> the leaves is so long, <laughs> not everyone yes. can. Take that. And the hair that the the shoes is like this this size. Yes. So the the other so I have to using. The combination of the uh, you know the uh, the ancient beauties and and the Western uh, cutting to make right. it look beautiful and natural. Yeah. So so the other question too that I have it regards uh, the same story done in television. How is that yeah. different for you in terms of uh, uh, doing it for, for the camera and doing it for the stage? Now, first of all, there are a lot more characters in the TV series, and it's a lot longer. <laughs> and there's a lot more involved. But beyond that, do you uh, beyond the costume changes and all of that? Do you think of how to build a costume differently? Hmm. I, I think more close to a movie, if the TV TV series, 
But the TV yeah. series, we try to move it towards the, the opera. So that when they're coming up, the costume is bigger. You know, the, the decorations is more than more than a normal, normal dress. So that we have some decoration, we have some move to the dramatic kind of style, but the base is uh, realistic. So that yeah. we have the room, we have everything realistic. The furniture oh. is beautiful, antique. We use a lot of antique, you know, so it's real. So yeah. that, you know, but how we put, compose it, how we put this, how we put a camera with all this thing, we have a lot of uh, theater aesthetics inside. To compose, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the the composition, so that their their dress is yeah. is abnormal, but it's also really beautiful on stage. Mm. Okay, well, you you have uh, you, we've been talking a lot about aesthetics, but you have a, a plain background behind you, and I have a plain background behind me. So let's <laughs> let's look at some pictures from the show, and also some pictures from the collection from the museum's collection. This mm. we open up with a, with a, with a obviously a, a picture from the show. Could you yeah. could you tell us a little bit about this scene and mm. what you were intending to show and some of and, and tell us about what we should look at at this this particular mm. yeah I, I influenced by two elements one element is Chao Xie Jin is uh, he, he is the one who collecting kites you know all these kites different kites and I I I stole the colors from there you know he he have a really trained dynasty style of color and the second thing is. A Chao Xie Jin family is doing the fabrics, a really beautiful for for the for the emperor. Mm -hmm. So that they they the home hometown and it's like Chao Xie Jin when he he's young, so you're always seeing the the uh, you know the machine, the wooden machine, yeah. making all these yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. fabric, beautiful fabric. So that you can see that, that, behind it's like a that kind of machine to making fabric. Right. Yeah. And that, that's, that's, that's very convenient for you to design. To design images when you have a, a, a story, Dream of the Red Chamber, which is about a family that was involved in textiles. Yeah. And so also, have... this thing is separated into pieces so that they can change train composition. Mm -hmm. And one thing is really important I was using the self shadow puppet method so that you give lights from behind. Ah, okay. So you can change the atmosphere really easily. It's like a dream, it, it's like a colors, the soft. To the front, so we we uh, I think this stage is really important for this wheel and wheel wheel and wheel moving moving up a set because it's difficult to build a da guan yuan you know the garden the famous gardens it's really important for um uh, dreams of red chamber so I use this way to to get the da guan yuan always on stage. I, I'm not sure that we've said up and up to this point, but you are responsible here, not just for the costumes in this case, but also the entire visual design. Yeah. yeah. So this, this entire uh, uh, little little portrait is is conceived and, and, and developed by you. Mm. Um, <laughs> what what I find interesting is the the scale of the people versus the set. Because it really is a, a, a an enormous mansion that you see on, on this stage, and yet the the, the people uh, the the, the um, space they occupy is is quite minimal. What sense of proportion did you bring into this idea? I think to, uh, my experience of making stage, we always uh, it's different from movie. Movie, I can take you know several composition close up and everything to see the what is going on, right? But in stage, you always that's more. <laughs> <laughs> always is the position, you know, the proportion of a uh, of a singer or, or a actor on this huge huge space, so that up, you know, just like two meter, everyone. So the most important thing is a lower two meter, so that mm. we have to design what happened on the top. This is yeah. a really um, technical things, so that we we build the whole story moving enough flexible movement so that they can change in atmosphere, follow the atmosphere, changing form, changing lighting, changing color, and, and make this become really interesting. Not just one scene and never moving. Yeah. 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 You get bored. Uh, yeah. Well, well from, from this, I, I would like to, to step back a little bit from the, uh, uh, from the opera house and walk a little bit uh, down the, 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 the uh, street a bit to the museum and see a couple of pieces from the collection there. 
Yeah. And if we can go to the next slide, we see something that looks kind of similar to that, that visual world. Uh, so Jay, could you discuss these pieces a little bit and where they come from? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is a very typical um, picture from the Qing Dynasty. And uh, as you we know, in the Confucian society, the male offspring was very important to pass on family lineage. And so that's why you see a whole bunch of boys at play. And in many ways, uh, Bao Yu, who was the leading character of the novel and of, of course of the opera, was a golden boy. So from very early childhood, he, there's expectation for what him to be. And here in the detail, you see a boy right holding a brush, which means the boy's mm -hmm. expectation by the family is to be a scholar, a civil servant, a civil official, the imperial government. That would be Bao Yu's typical pathway into adulthood. Of course, he never became that way. He was a person of a very high individualistic ideas and passionate for beauty and, uh, and a really wonderfully uh, uh, engaged um, uh, 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 with his uh, uh, female friends and, uh, and associates. But here, nevertheless, as you said, this is a setting. And so give you a um, sort of a corner of the Da Guan Yuan, uh, the garden of grand views. And it could be very much a, a corner of this imagined garden. So even though the novel was fictional, and uh, as uh, the author wanted to claim, everything was fictional and fake, but actually it was deeply related in reality. I think his fiction actually transcends the reality, crystallized the reality into some of its essence. So here, if you come see this picture and come to the museum and see similar objects, really can transport you back into the time of the setting for the opera and understand the, the authentic feel of the, the culture environment of the time then we can further appreciate how far Tim has taken it from this original uh, departing station through his artistic imagination and made something that is 21st century, but same time spiritually actually harking back to the 18th and the 19th century. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I think we have here, um, well, certainly uh, a representation of a Chinese robe, but we also have, if we move to the next slide, an actual picture of a Chinese robe, I believe. Can, yes. we, can, we, can we move to the next slide, please? There yeah, this go. is a, a, a Qing sort of uh, the high class women's robe. And uh, but Tim would have pointed out to you, so it was not very easy to move in this, <laughs> you know, in the opera, because, you know, you are a poor lady or a noble of a high birth. You typically in social occasion would be stationary rather than moving around. So this is a wonderfully beautiful, but like everything else about Chinese art of that period, it's a laden with auspicious meanings. So every motif here, particularly two types of a motif, peony, peony of flower, of for prestige, honor, often case reserved to the people of the highest social station. The other is butterflies, means mm. joy and also means continuous generation of offspring so the family could continue. So you could imagine all the, you know, uh, the people of that time envelope their physical being with auspicious meanings. Yes, indeed. Well, let's, let's take a look because from here, um, we see, as we say, a lot, a lot of motifs, a lot of designs, uh, and this is the, the real robe. Let's take a look at the next frame because the next slide, will actually, I think, have Tim's version of these, these costumes and these designs. Uh, and if I may point out one thing, I think the one consistency is the choice of the color red. Yes. <laughs> red <laughs> is, of course, a red chamber, but a red, of course, is an auspicious color. The capable yeah. of uh, expelling evil spirits, if you will. That's why I see a lot of red. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, a, a great point, Jay. Uh, Tim, could you explain a little bit now about the costumes? Uh, first of all, explain who the characters are, but, but also um, uh, why certain things are looking the way that they look here. Yeah, I think you can see in the left hand side, you know, two of the left hand side. One is, uh, you know, the right pictures, left hand side is a Jambu, it's, a, you know, the, the oldest ladies of the family, and he's a really high positions. 
So that at, at the costume, you can see many, many decoration things on her. And the second one, you know, the and the left hand side, they are in the marriage, is the wedding dress. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because inside, uh, that is um, sebo tai, sebo tai. Uh, it's it's a, it, it, you, you can take it as a, uh, you know, it's a competitor of Lin Dai Yu. And she, and she is the one that family won uh, Bao Yu to marry her. And then at the same time, uh, Bao Yu is expecting uh, marry uh, Lin Dai Yu. But when they take off the, you know, the flybacks and you see the different woman. <laughs> But they know each other from childhood, so they know each other. Yes. So that this is a yes. complicated uh, relationship of the costume change and everything. So that I let the white white uh, costume to be dressed inside, you know, to following you know the whole drama, and we add a piece of mm -hmm. the wet um, outfit, you know, to to make it look like she is in a wedding position. So in this yes. one, yes. you, you and, and, come out with. Um, continuity of the movement of the costume change. Mm -hmm. and, and as uh, Jay also said, there's a lot of red uh, going on here. In this part, particularly because there's a wedding involved and red is the, one of the main auspicious colors of, 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 a, of a wedding. Um, what I find in all of these pictures from right from the first one that we have, there's a, a very painterly aspect of all of the colors in mm. the backdrop, in, in, in the costumes mm. and uh, it is very much of a piece that they all go together. And yet something that I see here is that uh, more or less when you see any of these characters, you kind of know who they are before mm -hmm. you even have them. And, and uh, I, I have to say, I, I, have, I watched theater and I watched TV movies for many, many years before I picked up on costuming was not just about the clothing or the designs or, 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 or the colors, but it also conveys characters. Mm -hmm. And so uh, can you give us a quick view of, of um, say what Bao Yu is wearing or what uh, uh, any of the characters are wearing that, that you put in just to illustrate who they are? Mm -hmm. I think this is quite systemized in this one because um, like Jia, Jia family, you know, the family Jia, I, I put it in the dark brown. So in dark brown, in the full of dark brown, I need Jia Bao Yu to be jumped out. So I give him red. And all the things about his, uh, his marriage. So the whole mm -hmm. thing, he's, uh, you know, just all kind of red on, on him. So that I need to get a position, an isolation of Lin Dai Yu and the, you know, poetic size of her. So it's quite different from the others. I give her green and I add the red on, on, on the collar. So that when you see her in and bow you on the stage, you find that they are a couple, you know, a kind of um, couple on stage and jumping up with all other colors. So they're always you're seeing- They're, they're um, complementary. The cutting is losing. Another cutting is really quite formal. So Linda, your character is coming out really easily. And that's mean Jia Bao Yu don't like all this formal. Jia Bao Yu is, you know, more close to Lin Dai Yu. And they yes. are special. You know, that's the one we want to build up. Okay, good. that's great. Now, can we go to the next slide? And we have, uh, I think, uh, uh, another view of, of costuming. Mm. Uh, so yes. Jay, can, can we talk about some of the, the ornateness here and what, what is, um, involved in all of this. Y yes, here again, you see the butterfly on the detail in the lower left corner and uh, the other auspicious flowers, all full of uh, good meanings. And, but uh, I really want to focus on the rondos, right? The embroidered rondos in the detail. This is an informal women's jacket, actually made for the end of the 19th century. So uh, maybe about a hundred years later than the setting of the novel. But this actually speaks to the enduring tradition of the Red Chamber, Dreams of the Red Chamber. Here you see the a moment of the most important episode in that novel, which is Dai Yu, bearing flowers. She was in absolutely total loneliness uh, uh, and uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the very sad state of uh, a meaning, uh, a being. She was uh, 
collecting flowers in her garden and try to find a place to bury them because for her, this mundane world is full of impurities, bad things going on. And only the flower symbolizes the purity of a spirit. And she simply did not want flowers to decay by the wayside. and want to collect them and bury them together with the poetry. So that's why you see in the, the half of the image on the left that she's collecting the flowers with her maid and she was ready to find a spot to bury them. On the right side, she is absolutely accomplished the lady. She's a, the, among, within the, all the 100 plus characters in the novel, she probably was the best poet and also accomplishing other forms of art. Here she is playing the ancient Qing instrument, the most important the scholarly instrument in traditional Chinese culture, which typically would be dominated by male scholars, yet in this case, a female lady was as good as any male. And here she is playing that music, yet the world still could not accept her. And in this particular case, accept her into the jazz family, even though she was related, she was also of a high birth, but still the political intrigues got into the way. And so this is a very important moment of that novel, I'm sure, you know, they'll be uh, 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 in the opera as well. And people loved that. So they cherished them by making the episodes of the story onto the garments so people can wear about them. You can imagine the ladies congregate wear and comment on each other's clothing as the ladies do, <laughs> and to tell stories about that. So I think it is very enduring to indicating the long timelessness of that novel and some of the timelessness of the issue that women are still facing today. I think mm -hmm. that's why Dreams of Red Chamber is still relevant very much for our life today. And same thing, the Asian Museum collection, no matter when the art was made, it's relevant for our life today. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one reason that the 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 story just continues to to gain and readers who not just new readers but same readers who return year after year to read this book. Um, you know, we've looked a lot and decoded a lot of this um, uh, large scale things. I'm very interested to look at some of the smaller items because these are things that have great import as well. If we can continue to uh, look at the next slide now. There's a museum piece uh, that I find really interesting and people might not know. Oh, this one. Yeah, uh, I think this Tim, is a piece uh, that dates about one, actually nearly 700 years older than the, uh, the uh, Dreams of a Red Chamber's time. But why we chose this piece? It is arguably one of the most important, beautiful pillow made of porcelain in the shape of a lotus and held by a little baby, right? And the, Artistry was wonderful. It's a transcendent time. We still love it today. I think easily we could all fall in love with it. But also speaks to Tai Yu's great knowledge of antiquity. Among her many talents is her appreciation of the cultural heritage and the cultural antiquities. And uh, she, is, more than anybody else, has that sensibility. So I would very much imagine a similar piece would be in her bedchamber that she would enjoy it. And, and yeah. write poetry about it. So that's why we choose this piece. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, I find it just a, a, a wonderful juxtaposition of, of great auspicious symbols and would probably be surprisingly comfortable considering that it's, uh, it, it, it is itself very hard. The placement and, is very smooth. And that would typically would have put away a thin piece of a cloth beautifully woven or embroidered. So there's a further, you know, uh, 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 um, adornment to the piece, then you can unveil the piece and you, you could use it, but also you could treat it as discussing of uh, something that you treasured and collected in one's uh, uh, possessing. Yes, well, let's, let's look at our, our next slide and we have another item. And this is made of a nephrite or we call it jade. You know, yeah. arguably jade is the most important material for Chinese people, even today. And it's a, throughout thousands of years. And again, very auspicious meaning, you know, the plum blossoms is the flower that bloom earliest, even before winter ends. It is a harbinger of a spring. So, and again, with auspicious birds. So you could imagine 
this implement actually in the form of a lock, of a lock would be given to a young child, a boy or girl, for their yes. meaning, for their auspicious, successful life. And they would sometimes hear on, on very, very special occasions on their neck. Actually, let's not forget. And in one of the characters in the, uh, in, in the red chamber is Bao Cai, who would be, turn out to be the uh, bride for uh, Bao Yu. Bao Cai was born with something special, with a golden lock on her yes. neck. So her marriage is sometimes, in some way, is preordained with Bao Yu, who born with a jade in her, his mouth, right? So, but this is made of jade. But imagine that um, this piece of jade, which is a well-wishing grand, a uh, wen uh, um, that uh, people could carry, could see, imagine Bao Yu's grandmother would be holding a piece like this when she went about or presided over family occasions or the wedding and uh, or the birthday parties. This is a absolutely impractical piece. It has served no practical function except auspicious meaning of granting your best wishes. So, so you can wish yourself the very best and wish others with it. Called Louis, as you wish. Great. I think that we have one more of the pictures from the museum. Which oh, this is again uh, meant to, to the, the next. This is a made of a carved lacquer of the Qing Dynasty, and it meant to give you a setting. Again, it could be a corner of the in the garden of the grand views. It's a very typical for scholarly settings. The the um the novel also describes of different parties. There's so many parties. You know, some are, you know, only by the ladies alone, some are by, you know, Bao's father and others, some are combined. But you could imagine this is a garden scene, the parties will be held. Or this could be a scene that when Bao's sister, who is the imperial consul, came back to the family compound to visit. It will be, you know, of course, decorated with all kinds of banners and textiles and uh, festoons with auspicious implements. But this gives you a idea of what an 18th, 19th century Chinese scholarly garden look like. So once again, if you come to see these pieces uh, on the image here, also come to the museum, they give you a sense of the cultural environment, cultural setting, which uh, is the stage upon which the dreams would be played out. That's great. Well, I think that uh, we can we can leave our, our show and tell at the moment. And I've asked many questions, and we're going to have um, so a couple of questions from the audience that come in. But before we start, I would love to know, Tim, is there anything you'd like to know from Jay, and vice versa? Is is there anything <laughs> that Jay would like to ask Tim before we go on to that? Let's start, Tim. Anything that uh, you want to know about what it's like to amass a collection like this or live day to day with this in your in your uh, your office basically oh actually i am uh, i'm not a collector of course and um, but i i always in the museum to looking at uh, all this thing for reference and and designs and when i'm doing a uh, dream of red chamber i think of course asian art museum is really important for me for the spiritual foot <laughs> so <laughs> i i always be there and looking looking for the colors, the materials, the ribbons of, of every details, uh, because this is really, we can really close to look at it and spend time on them. So yeah. I, I, I just want to, um, uh, but I know many, many good things happen, you know, they have special program of relooking at these um, historical things with a modern angles and, you know, many, many things is really good. I, I hope to, um, because I'm doing a lot of, um, uh, like I understand these things, I want to put into a modern aesthetics that the young generation can understand and love it. Because if just looking at that, maybe it's difficult for them to understand. But now I find that more and more young generation, they like to look at that too. So it's, um, we love to have more modern ideas with the Asian things it can be worked together. Mm -hmm. So Jay, is there anything that you'd like to uh, to ask Tim about his process or how things got to the stage? 
Yes, first of all, I want to mention a small disagreement with uh, Tim. I think uh, he, uh, Martin said that he is not a collector. I think I'm sure he's a collector with his eyes. <laughs> the collecting does not require only you physically possess something. Yeah, yeah. I think the best collectors always use our heart and mind, our eyes. I think Tim is among the very best collectors there is. Thank you. My question to him is that, you know, in many ways, the Qing Dynasty art is so rich, so vibrant. That's why I say that in some way, material culture in the Qing Dynasty attended epigees in Chinese imperial history. Just yes. look at the, uh, the colorful plate behind me. It has a symbol of a phoenix and the dragons, so the emperors, the empress, or male and female, in wonderful uh, combination full of uh, colors and auspicious meaning. So how do you distill from such a over luxury of motifs and the colors into something that essentially not only be able to serve a spirit of time, but also can draw up actually a feel of the 21st century. So that's a not easy task. <laughs> I think really important when you're seeing the uh, original people uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Yunnan, Mei, uh, Miao Zhu, that there's a man, many different, because they're still living in that kind of things, they, they put every details on their costume. So the costume pattern is, you know, is showing who they, they are, how rich they are, how, how good they are, you know, all this kind of thing. But are using all this pattern and, you know, all these aesthetics to emphasize who is the character. Maybe Jabo, you I must give him some dragons to make him impure, you know, feeling. And then in that you I will give the, you know, like uh, bamboos and other things to, you know, to make her like a, you know, really good, uh, high quality, quality, you know, a poet. So all, all these things is helping me to, to making character alive. Yeah. Well, well, we have a couple of questions that have come through. One, uh, someone asks, is there a version of the book that either of you could recommend reading before seeing the opera? Now, they didn't necessarily say that it has to be the full text. Mm. It could be a shortened text. It could be an illustrated version of the book, because I know there are uh, yeah. apparently some of those are in existence. Do you have mm. any suggestions? I think it's better to read the book, but this is a difficult way because the book is so so big, you know, like, uh, you know, 80, 80, you know, 80 books is from Chao Shijin, and another 40 is uh, Gao, Gao Er. Um, they have many, many details, and they write sometimes it's really realistic, sometimes really poetic. <laughs> there are a lot mm -hmm. of yeah. cultures, symbol, and all the culture things, so that you have to be really understand. So it, it's like, um, Unfortunately, it, it's a complicated, so it's really difficult for us to, to push it into it simple because everything is symbolic. Everything has a meaning. When they're putting that together, they have a meaning. They're using the meaning and become uh, the, the style of the art form and to tell the story so that they, at the same time, the tragedy is, is being told and also the beauty is being told. Yeah. This, this I think is that's an excellent question, separate. but mm. I'm afraid I will disappoint the, uh, the, the, the audience who asked the question because <laughs> um, if you are speaking about English versions, I have yes. to confess I have never read any of the English translation because I'm fearful. I'm so much in love with this uh, novel and you could ask <laughs> me how many times I've read it in Chinese. I yes. still need to muster the courage of reading any English because I'm worried about all the subtleties, <laughs> all the nuances all the content is reading in between the lines get lost, but someday I should. <laughs> someday I should read well, <laughs> in English. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I should, I should probably jump in on there and to say that the, the opera libretto itself, uh, the, one of the big inspirations for this particular story was the David Hawkes translation that, that came out yeah. in Penguin in five volumes. That was the first, uh, I believe the first time the entire book was translated uh, and it was a yeah. almost a lifetime project for him and, yeah, and, his, and his son-in-law um, and he was certainly a very very respected scholar so yeah, yeah yeah no another question that i have here is uh for you to i mean i have one person who said well the, the costume exhibition at the museum is just a a, a whole promotion oh, for the opera my and the opera is itself a, 
a promotion for, for, the, for the collection at the museum. So uh, in terms of, of collaboration, people are asking if there was, uh, what the level of collaboration was between the two of you. Maybe, uh, I, yeah. Um, I uh, somehow, I got to the signal that my connection is unstable. So I may miss, but I think I got to the, uh, um, okay. the, uh, the question. Museum, we really just provide the resources because the collection is so rich and uh, Kim is so knowledgeable. So, you know, we really make ourselves available to him. And so, because the artistic creation and the process sometimes is very individualistic. We want to give him whatever he wants and then he take whatever he needs, right? Visually, <laughs> not take any object <laughs> away from the museum. Oh, I Again, correct, I correct with the from eyes the and the mind and heart. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, actually, I was very surprised to, you know, the first time I see his design, I, you know, I'm fascinated. But this is so wonderfully beautiful. So this partnership is really where providing resources and him in the driving seat. And uh, as to the collaboration with opera, we have always been in collaboration whenever there's a, a opera that Asia related. And so we really enjoy this wonderful relationship as well. Yeah, Kim. I think it's really good. I always has a background. You know, I, I want to fly. I want to fly away so that I, I really need a beautiful base, you know, that I can come from. You know, I always come back to the origin to find the uh, new language from there. But I can't find a new language from nowhere, right? It's really important for me. Always remind me something new. Yeah. Well, we have another question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, asking, how did these people in the Qing Dynasty get their beautiful clothes? <laughs> and, and their question: did, did they did they have did they buy them in a market or did they get oh, them no, custom made? No. Um, yeah, all over all over the world, all this uh, elaborate costume is mixed by special people, and they work for the uh, rich family. And then you know, in Qing Dynasty, it's become really large scale, you know, for the emperor family. So that they have uh, a large, like uh, Chao Xie Jin Jia, their family, to, to building all this beautiful Yun Jin for this uh, emperor. It's a really difficult at that time, really modern method of, of doing that. So that it's a big factory with really serious process. Yeah. So that, you know, this is for all you need, you know, all these uh, noble people, fam uh, real family. But the common people, you cannot wear this. You, you can't wear any cost, get any pattern for the uh, imperial family. You, you will get died. You will get catch. <laughs> only, yes, the, they, only the family they, can, can. Don't do wear it. yellow and don't wear certain. Yellow uh, is, uh, you, if you are, uh, you know, kingdom is not, you, you have to be the king. You have to be the I king. I think that's. Five uh, fingers. <laughs> Another one is just four fingers. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 If I just add very briefly, uh, textile is a major um, forte of Chinese uh, material culture. You know, the silk, for example, is forever yeah. associated with China, mm -hmm. and uh, for the consumption of textile, you know, be, because it expresses your social status as well as your profession in life. Mm -hmm. So for the, the top society, the emperors and the princelings, their imperial workshop based in Beijing, but also in real life, the house ancestors was imperial agent staged in Southern China in the Yangtze River Delta for appropriate textile from that time, uh, from that region, which was famous for its uh, silk production and the weaving mm -hmm. and the embroidery. So mm -hmm. appropriation textile was very important for the commoners, as uh, uh, Tim mentioned, uh, there was a very vibrant market. You could indeed buy a lot from the textile stores, but of mm. course there were tailors, right, as, uh, uh, as well. So textile production was extremely vibrant. Mm. Yeah. It's really expensive, no. you know, fabrics at the time, yeah. Yeah, so we have a couple more questions that I think are not really valid for you two, but uh, they're more valid for the, the music and the text that are involved. But one, one final question that we have here is really 
what do the two of you see, or what does each of you see as the core appeal of, of The Dream of the Red Chamber, the novel, the story? Jay? What, what <laughs> Jim, the, I'll let you go what first. Is, <laughs> can, you, can you repeat uh, uh, the questions? Ben, yeah. Sorry? Can, can you repeat the questions? What, what is the key, the, the core appeal of Dream of the Red Chamber as a the story and a, and a novel? The, the, the appeal, what, what makes it appealing most? You, you know, the, the novel or the show? The, the, the story itself, basically. Oh, um, actually, it's a really sad story. It's talk about everything is a dream. And then, you know, like, I think it's more referred to uh, Zhao Shijin's, his own story. Everything is a dream. No matter what you see, how elaborate that you can see, you experience, everything is a dream. Everything is fate. Yeah. For me, I think that the phrase come to my mind that made the novel, the story most appealing is unfulfilled love. Mm. And that transcends entire humanity. You don't have to be a Chinese to understand it. You don't mm. have to be in the 18th century to understand it. This goes on in our very life every day, unfulfilled love, the yearning for love, particularly mm. yearning for love that transcends boundaries yet unfulfilled because of social conditions or other, the, could be political conditions or economic conditions, and the still the art and the passion for companionship. So I think that is transcends time and space. So that is a very, very important. The mm -hmm. other very uh, poignant part is just change of uh, fortune. That our life is so full of travesties and the tragedies that, uh, you know, you could be fortunate one day and fell into misfortune deeply the next day, but yet human spirit still transcends the how you sustain yourself in the time of difficulty. I think, um, so these are the qualities that I think to me the most enduring and uh, making the story relevant and appealing to everybody. Well, that's great. I think that we are all very much looking forward to this opera, and I really appreciated having this time together with you, too. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and, and thank you, Tim and Jay and Ken, um, and thank you all again. Uh, I hope you'll join us for a performance of Dream of the Red Chamber at San Francisco Opera. It um, opens on June 14th and runs through July third. And I'm pleased to extend a 25% discount code to you all for select performances. Uh, I will put that in the chat, but the code is AAMDRC22. Uh, and I also really wanted to extend a heartfelt thank you to our partner, the Asian Art Museum. As a reminder, the Asian Art Museum is literally down the street from San Francisco Opera. Uh, and so if you're coming to enjoy Dream of the Red Chamber, I really encourage you to stop by and see some of the objects that uh, were talked about today. And um, there's a special code to save $5 off admission with the code LANTERN, L-A-N-T-E-R-N. And in addition, on June 17th, the Asian Art Museum will open uh, Carlos Villa, the Worlds in Collision. Uh, it's been hailed by the New York Times as a fascinating document of bold and experimental self-expression. And it, the groundbreaking exhibit will celebrate the work and influence of San Francisco artist Carlo, Carlos Villa. It's also the first major museum retrospective dedicated to the work of a Filipino American artist. So I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, thank you again for coming and uh, being with us for this hour. And we hope to see you soon at the museum and at the opera. Yep. Really appreciate your time. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. For